Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the VH Virtual Event Space. Today, part three out of six of our basic photography series with Esteban Toro, sponsored by Sony. So for those of you who haven't been watching, we're going to get those links dropped so that you guys can catch up to get to where we are today, which today we're talking depth of field and optics. So Esteban, welcome, man. I, I missed you last week. I had to have Scott jump on here for me. And uh, so... Hello, missed out. Derek. Yeah, we miss you all here. Everyone was, no, without Derek, we will not start. You know, you're a rock star. So everyone was asking for you. That's lies. That's lies. They're, they're here for you, man. We're, your, we're here. Your you audience know. were, they were like, where is Derek? Where is Derek? We didn't come for Esteban. <laughs> we don't care about Esteban. And I was like, all right, all right. So Scott and I, we tried to do our best that day. Uh, <laughs> I, caught, I caught the replay. You guys... You guys did a great job and i see you brought out the big guns today you got them are, are we going to be talking about those lenses that's behind yeah, you there yeah, or yeah we will, awesome. we will be speaking about it yeah that's gonna be cool awesome well i hope everybody is strapped in ready to go has their questions ready uh today we're talking glass we're talking what's in focus and out of focus ha 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 Drop a little yeah <laughs> plenty Esteban. of things. Yes, I, I will turn it over to you again. If you guys do have any questions throughout, feel free to drop them in. We'll make sure that Esteban gets them answered for you. But Esteban, show is yours. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to this uh, third session where we'll be discussing. Uh, we'll just resume what we were already talking. Basic photography, how to take better pictures, how to control the camera. Uh, I received uh, plenty of good comments and questions after, which I love, and especially because uh, last last session, as I was saying, um, I think every every class I want you to have more questions than answers. That means that you are really starting to understand uh, this curiosity of how the camera works, and you will be practicing, and then you will have more questions, and that's the idea. Uh, some of you expressed to me that it helped you to clarify some ideas, understand better things that were a little bit hard to, to, to understand from the camera and from photography. And today I'm just going to throw into you, your brain more information. Uh, I hope you will follow along. And if not, we will always have the chance to, to answer through the questions. So let me share with you my screen. So... This is where we end last time, exposure, the triangle. And I want to go back again to this because if someone who was following the last uh, session had some questions, this is the time to do it. I know questions will come along during all the class, but we can start answering them. I just want to refresh a little bit what we talked last time. We talked about three things that modify everything about photography no matter if you're using your cell phone your dslr your mirrorless camera whatever you're using you're based on these three things shutter speed aperture and iso if you know and if you understand that these three settings change the whole exposure how the light is exposed in your picture then you're on the good track if you also understand that depending on the shutter speed, you will control if you will freeze the image or it will have motion, freeze the action or it will be like motion style, then you're also on the good track. If you understand that the aperture, if it's wider and if it's more open, you will have more light entering the camera, but at the same time, you will have a blurrier background, then you're all good. If you close it, if you close the, um, the aperture, then the background is going to look sharper, but it's going to be less light. The same thing with the ISO. If you have a lower ISO, like 100, 200, 400, you don't have so much noise, uh, but you also don't have a lot of light. If you increase your ISO to 1200 or 2400, 3600, whatever, you will start getting more ISO, this noise that is produced by the pixels just exploding. Um, Last session came a really good question that I wanted to solve that is like, okay, this is cool, but how, how I take the camera and understand if I'm, if I'm doing the right exposure, uh, do you use any special tool? How do how you do it? And I really want you to stay with us for, stick with us for the next uh, session where I will be explaining you this in detail, 
and how I especially use it with mirrorless cameras because it changed a lot from my experience with uh, DSLRs that I used to use before to mirrorless. So we will go to that, but this session will not be exactly about it. So hold on for that, it's coming soon and I will answer you this question. So this is just to refresh, but I also want to emphasize on something that we were talking here and that we were especially discussing about aperture. And it's, we said that if we uh, open the aperture, we have less depth of field. And it was like depth of field, depth of field, what is that? So we will finally talk about what is depth of field and we will try to solve it out. Basically, the depth of field is the, the level of focus that you will have from the subject to the background and from the subject to the foreground, to the camera. So if you want to put it in some way, I show you some good examples last time. And usually people think that depth of field is only modified or affected by the aperture that you're using. And that is true, but there are three things that really change how your aperture or how your depth of field will look like. So the first thing that will modify the depth of field is the distance between the camera and the subject. So here you have this uh, graphic that I included for you. If, and let me just stop sharing so you will see me a little bit. This is my camera. I'm pointing to, let's say, my hand. If my hand is further, the depth of field will be, I will have a like more sharper background and more depth of field. If I'm getting closer, then the depth of field is getting also close. So let me show you, I just, let me, I just want to pull my camera so I can see myself what I'm doing. But basically look at this. I'm showing you my finger. Right now, my finger is not in focus. If you look carefully, it's not in focus at all. If it's getting further and gets where it's right now here in focus, that's getting in focus. So how the depth of field is gonna change that? The closer we are to subjects, less depth of field. The further, more depth of field. So again, I know it sounds, it, it might seem, and I will show you some examples, you know it, but it's like, look at my hand, it's out of focus. Of course, it's because it's out of focus. I'm not focusing on this point, I'm focusing on my face. But if I get further, it has more and more like you, you can see it sharper. That's, that's what I'm really interested in showing you right now. So what does it mean and how does it affect the picture? We will get to that. I will just share my screen again. So basically, if the subject is farther from the camera, we will have a sharper background. If the subject is closer to the camera, we will have a blurry background. That's the principle of this, and this is how it's gonna work. That's the first thing that is gonna affect the depth of field. The second thing that is gonna affect the depth of field is the aperture, that we already talked about it. If the aperture is wide open, you will have a like a less sharp background. Um, if you close the, the aperture, it will be like bigger, like more, like let's say you will have a more deep depth of field, you will have more information in the background, and we will show some examples. And the third thing that is gonna change everything is the focal length. And what is the focal length? It's these numbers that we have in our lens that I'm, I'm sure many of you have even taken your camera and see like, okay, here is a 16, 20, 24, 28, 35. What is, what is all these numbers and why they are here? Like, what is all this? Okay, and I'm sure many of you are familiar if you have been uh, relating with photographers, they tell you like, oh yes, I was using my 50 millimeter lens. I was using my 35 millimeter lens. And I know that by fact, many photographers, we just learn these numbers and we sometimes have no idea what these numbers mean. And I will tell you uh, how these numbers come here to the game. But basically that's the, the focal length. It's every, these numbers that are happening here. So the shorter that is your focal length, let's say the wider the angle it is, the more depth of field you have. The wider, the longer the depth of field is, the, sh the less depth of field that you will have. So let, let's get this through examples so it will be easier to understand. So look at this picture. I took this photograph with, a, this is with a 70, 200 millimeter lens. And I am just 
that actually is this lens over here. I'm just gonna start showing you a little bit of lenses, but we will get to that. I was just shooting with this with this lens and my camera, and my model is just walking in front of me. Uh, this is Central Park. If you have been in in this in this beautiful part, you know that yeah, the trees uh, are quite big, but they don't look so compressed. So what I'm doing is that by just using a 200 millimeter lens and just getting uh, as close as I can to her, I'm compressing the background. And if you look carefully, there is not so much depth of field in this picture. So how you know it? Because if you look at the detail, she is in focus, uh, but everything that is in the background is out of focus and you cannot distinguish very well what is there. Let me show you the next picture and you will get a comparison. So it's the same place, same location, same model, uh, maybe a minutes of difference. But what you will notice here is that the background, we have more details, there is more information. You can start seeing, for example, the lights, and you can even understand that there are some trees and all that, you, you have more information. The difference with the two pictures is that this is taken with the, uh, the, the previous one was with the 7200 and the next one, is taken with the 16 35 millimeter lens. So let me show you a little bit more and we will get to that and I will start solving all this mess that I'm sure I'm creating in your head. Look at this picture, 16 35 millimeter lens, super far, I'm standing far from the fisherman. And if you look, everything looks kind of, it has the same level of depth of field. I'm getting a little bit closer. And if you start looking, the mountains get a little bit less of depth of field. There is less, less detail. It's not so in focus. It's, it's, it has less information. Let's, let's put it in that way, as if you compare with this picture. And then look at this one, when it, where he's super close. Well, he's super close. If you compare how his face look like with the mountains, then you understand like, oh, he's in focus and the mountains are not in focus. So it is true that I focus on his face. I literally took and put the, the focus point on his face. But it is also true that because see, since he is closer to the camera and to my lens, everything that is in the background has less details. So this is the first law that I'm telling you, that is the distance between the camera and the subject. So as I'm approaching to the fisherman, it, the background and the foreground as well, because we discussed this last time, I look at the rocks on the, on the bottom, left side of the picture, uh, they start to reduce the depth of field that you have. So everything, this is my main subject, everything that is in the, in the foreground and everything that is in the background starts to compress and you will have less information. You will have less detail. It will have less depth of field. Um, and also the aperture starts to affect. So if in this picture, I'm using a f2.8. This is with a 16 35 millimeter lens, and I'm using 2.8, so it's ultra wide open, my aperture, meaning that the depth of field also will decrease. Why I'm using a 2.8? Because this is during the blue hour. It's very, very dark, and uh, the light on his face is just coming from the lamp that, he's, uh, that he has in his, in his boat. So, um, Basically, I have to use all the light available. That's why uh, it has a little bit less of depth of field. But the truth is that um, since I'm also using a wide angle lens, plus a 16, 35 millimeter lens, it has like this look that if you, if you don't look carefully, you can, you can still see the details from the mountains. You can see the shape. It's not confusing as it happens, for example, with the 24, with the 200, with the 7200 here where part of the background is completely gone and you don't have information there. But let us let me show you a little bit more of examples. We talk about this picture. This is taken with a 85 millimeter lens. I'm just getting super close to her. And as I'm getting super close, the background is getting also out of focus. But it's, and I told you last time, I use a 1.4 uh, aperture for this picture, but I'm also getting super close. So what I'm doing is that she is my model, my hand is my model, I'm getting close. And since I'm using an 85 millimeter lens that is kind of a telephoto lens already, I'm using 1.4 and, use, and I'm getting super close. I'm reducing in all ways possible, I'm reducing the depth of field. That's why when you look at this portrait, you can barely see the Empire State and you can barely see the, the buildings. Of course, you can recognize there is a city in the background, 
but it doesn't look as sharp and yeah, as crispy as it looks on her face. So that's that's the difference between between these pictures. And let me show you another one. Here we have um, a girl just uh, working on the on the rice fields in Vietnam. I'm shooting with a 7200. I'm a little bit far from her, and I'm just focusing on her. And since I'm using at 7200 in maybe 200 millimeter or 140 something like that, all the background, all the rice fields in the background look out of focus. Look, they don't look sharp uh, as if you compare with the grass here and with her face. That can be used as a way of creating pictures. If you compare with this picture where everything seems to be in focus, but still, if I look carefully, perhaps the mountains in the background start to lose a little bit of detail because they are too, too far. And I'm still using uh, maybe probably a 5.6 uh, aperture that it's still quite open. So I'm not getting all details. And the reason for that is that I need to compensate with the light. I know this is getting messy, but we'll get to that. I just want you to, uh, I'm just showing you how using certain lenses and certain apertures help you to create this beautiful bouquet or this beautiful uh, blurry background that we love so much because I know that you all love so much this effect sometimes. And I will, yeah, I will give you my personal opinion on that. So all these pictures are the same. I'm just uh, taking the, for example, here, um, it, this is in Vietnam as well. I'm just waiting with my camera. Probably this is with a 70, maybe 24, 70 millimeter lens. I'm just waiting there. I see these kids coming. I just zoom in. I just do this with my lens. And then I just wait for the right time and I take the picture. So something that I love about um, playing with the depth of field is that it helps you to avoid distractions in the background. Look at the picture that I'm showing you here um with with Lara in the um, in this in central park if i have someone just one person walking or i have something that will be distracted immediately it will like impact on the picture and i cannot create this whole beautiful wide angle picture because it will be a little bit hard unless it's something that has some relation with with the picture or with her walking with the umbrella but if not, it's, it's just noise in my picture, in my composition. The same thing with the fisherman. The reason why this picture looks uh, beautiful and let's say like big and strong and powerful is that there is nothing in the background that is bothering, that is distracting, that has nothing to do with the picture that I'm creating. The same with this picture. But in pictures like the kids that I just show you, uh, I have a lot of little things that might be distractive. So that's when I like to use cer at certain points uh, this uh, to play with the depth of field and reduce it. So all the attention of the viewer, in this case, you will be on the kids walking. Same situation with this picture. It helped me to compress, to try to understand where is my attention and where is where I want you to look at. So I'm taking decisions about how my picture is going to look like when I'm choosing the lens, when I'm choosing how far I'm going to be from my subject, and also what's the aperture that I'm going to use. So all these decisions matter when we're talking about photography. This is taken with a, a 200, 600 millimeter lens. I'm on the other side of the island. So something that, of course, uh, the focal lens help us to to achieve is to reach something that is very, very far, or if we want to use, a, if we want to cover everything in one single picture, we just use a wide angle lens and it helps us to, to cover a lot of space. We will get into the focal lens and what, what it all this means. And I will get back to these pictures, but I want to show you the comparison between, between these two. This, this mosque is super, is, is super, super close to me. Well, this one is super far and I'm just capturing with a, with a telephoto lens, getting it, making it super close. And if you look at something that is very interesting is that uh, look at the, the buildings and the houses look the, almost kind of the same size as the, as the temple in the background. So it's very beautiful because the compression helps things to make, make and look bigger than they are, very powerful, framing the whole thing which is something that you can use in your narrative after. 
Um, this is taken with a with a telephoto lens, probably a 70 to 100. And then you have the same place taken with a 16, 35 millimeter lens. So you can tell how, uh, for example, the, the yeah, these rocks, these mountains over here become powerful, strong. They they become, they have like this compression that is beautiful. Well, here they look a little bit smaller. They don't have like you are showing the whole place, but they don't seem as big as they seem before. So it's all about perspective. And this is also taken with a telephoto lens. This is with a wide angle lens. That is the whole landscape. That's why the, the balloon seems very, very, very tiny. They, you can barely see them. So let's get into optics and what it, it's all these that we were talking. But it's all these that we were talking here um, about these optics. So I told you about these numbers that we many times photographers and a lot of people don't know what it means. And if you look in your Sony cameras, there is a circle and a line here in the middle. That's where the sensor of the camera is located. So basically, there is a distance between the sensor of the camera and the point where the image is produced. So the light comes, let's say the light comes from here, there is a source of light. And at some point in the lens, the image is produced. The point where the image is produced to the sensor of the camera it's the millimeter distance that we call the focal length. So for example, from here, 16, 16 millimeters means that from the point where the, the image is created in the lens of the camera till the sensor, there are 16 millimeters and so on. 24, 35, 50, 70, 200. Reality is that when I give you this information and I tell you like, the the light gets to some point and goes to the sensor like the like this the light creates the image here and goes to the sensor doesn't tell much for us as a photographer and especially that will not impact or change anything in what we need to do like in our daily life besides the fact that that, that is the numbers that we can create here and this is a language that we have to communicate as photographers because if i want to tell derek like hey derek can you give me um 200 millimeter lens he will understand exactly what i'm looking for it's just a point of reference and he will just tell me like oh esteban i don't have that lens but i have a 200 600 so here you have here you got if you need it um it's basically a common language that you will start getting related and i know it becomes a little bit hard at now because it's plenty of numbers but i want you to get familiar with the following wide angle lenses like this one that I have here is the 1635. So 16 to thir till 35, we can consider that it's a wide angle lens. After that, uh, let me show you some pictures that I have taken with 1635 millimeter lens, something like this, very wide. You can see the whole scene and the whole composition, the whole huge tree plus the, the, the farmers just walking with that buffalo in the front. So everything fits there. I can also make a beautiful portrait, include a little bit of the location, the perspective gets everything, gets bigger, gets wider. I can, of course, capture a landscape or a city, something that looks very like big and majestic. Again, something to include a lot of things in my composition and so on. These are some just examples that I took with a wide angle lens, 16, 35 millimeter lens. And then we have something as the lens that I'm using in, in the camera that you're looking at me, but is the 24, 70 millimeter lens. Uh, these type of lenses will help you. Uh, these are zoom lenses, by the way, and there will be two type of lenses, zoom and fixed lens, but we will, we will get to that. But uh, 24, 70 goes into, like goes from, let's say kind of a wide angle to a telephoto lens, uh, crossing things like the 50 millimeter lens that is very famous because it, it gives the, the 50 millimeter lens, it's very loved by photographers uh, and especially by filmmakers because when you use a 50 millimeter lens, it's the closest you can get of uh, the human eye. So when you want to create a point of view perspective, if you use a 50 millimeter lens, it's like if you're looking only with one eye, uh, that's approximately how the camera will look like if you compare it with your eye. So that's why 50 millimeter is very welcome in film and 
because that creates this this uh, first point of view perspective that is very interesting. Um, and you will have this type of pictures with the 2470. So if, if you look, it's like I can still capture something that is very wide, but I'm not getting, I mean, I'm getting a huge landscape, but I'm also cropping part of the landscape that I'm not interested. For example, this is a, this is a theater. So I'm a theater in the middle of the mountain. So I'm just capturing part of the theater. I'm not interested in showing the whole area. Or this is a this is a really beautiful waterfall, but I'm just standing like in the uh, like on the top of near the, the waterfall. But there is parts of the park that I'm not interested in showing, so I'm just starting to crop 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 areas directly with the lens that I'm using. Um, again, with a 24 70 millimeter lens, look at the difference. Like I can capture a whole landscape like this one, and I can then go to something. A little bit more like like a closer close up uh, shot that it's this girl just working on her net, fixing it, and and I am able to to play all the way in this. I can also make a beautiful landscape, but it's not super wide. Uh, these are I don't know if you remember the pictures that I show you of the highest dunes in the world in the in I think it was a previous or the first episode. Um, that I was just flying in the helicopter. This is from the ground. And what you see in the background is just a huge mountain uh, of, of, it's a sand dune uh, in the background. So you're just getting super close to the, to the trees. So all these pictures are taken with a 24, 70 millimeter lens, this picture of the uh, Grand Canyon. So here you have. Then we have lenses like this that I have here, the 70 to 100. 7200, we can consider that it's already a telephoto lens. Um, these lenses will help me to get things close, but it will also create um, a, a, a compression in the things that I'm capturing. So look, for example, uh, at the kids here, at the monks just walking. And then let, let me show you the compression, the level of compression. Look at the houses. In the in the foreground, and look at the at the temple in the background. They all look kind of the same size. And look, even the mountain that is that is super big on the background on the left side. All these things look quite similar on the size if you compare them. And the reason for that is that they are like I'm just compressing with the lens, making them making everything look closer, and that's very very interesting. Understanding what lens to use is very important because it will help you to plan ahead. So for example, when I was taking this photograph, um, I knew that this is in Varanasi in India and these are the crematories. So basically they're burning people here. And I knew at first that I wasn't gonna be able to have access to, to photograph super close. So I decided that I wanted to have uh, a telephoto lens that will allow me to get a little bit closer um, without getting physically close to the place. And uh, we can discuss more about it. This is a guy just walking with his buffalo, again, with a, with a 70 to 100 millimeter lens, just getting super close. And if you notice, look, these are the same mountains that I show you from the um, fisherman. So, well, that is the same region. So if you, if you compare this picture with the, with the picture of the fisherman in the, and the mountains in the background, they are so, so different. Like here they look massive mountains. And that's because of the compression of the telephoto lenses, which I personally love. And it's sometimes, I understand, it's, it's hard to, to understand where, where is the compression. Because if you look at something super big and massive like these sand dunes, flying in a doors of helicopter in Namibia, then you will understand that there is a huge difference in the proportion of what it's of how close is the subject to me. I'm flying here in a helicopter, maybe 2000 feet um, from the sand dunes. I'm here probably a couple of, I don't know, like a hundred feet from, from my model. So it's all changing and it, it creates a new perspective and it creates a new narrative when you're creating your pictures. So let me show you, for example, this one. Um, this is in Madagascar, the um, Valley of Baobabs. It's really beautiful place. 
And if you look at this picture, the baobabs look huge. They look massive and they are massive. They are quite big, but the optic that I'm using, is also helping to exaggerate that feeling of how big the, the trees are. And the reason for that is that I'm just compressing. I'm standing super far from where these two girls are. And I'm just standing there with my lens. I just zoom in all the way to 200 millimeter. And I'm just waiting for them to, for something to happen. And then they just came walking. Uh, I, I remember that I tried this picture multiple times, like with cars coming and also a horse. And I like many, many things came in front of my lens and I was just waiting for, for something to happen there. But what I like about it is that if you look at the girls and if you look at the trees, they look absolutely huge. And that's, that's what I was looking with my picture, that it will look very, very, very massive. Look at this um, a famous place here in the States, a famous location. I was really interested in having that compression so I will show the model very as almost as big as the mountains that are in the background. And of course, it doesn't make any sense when you're looking um, when you're not looking through the viewfinder and using a 200, uh, 70, 200 millimeter lens. The mountains in the background with your with your naked eyes, it will just look super, super, super far. And I remember that uh, some people just came by to, to look at the picture that I was taking and they were like, but you cannot see the background. Why, why you don't want her to be close? And I remember this is my wife, Lara. I was just telling Lara, like, you have to walk super far from me so I can just take the, the, the wider I can go with my lens and just capture it uh, like that. So that's, that's what it produces. And then you have something like this beauty here. Uh, this is another telephoto lens. This goes from 200 to 600 millimeters. And basically, this is what, is, what, is, what this is doing is just getting things even closer and closer. So this is the Dead Valley. Um, I made Lara a run in the early morning just to catch the, the sunrise light. Uh, so she had to hike up this hill that was very, very, very huge. Um, she had just to go all the way up and wait for, for the sunrise. Um, and I remember that I was with a friend and actually, if you want to go and, and see how is the behind the scenes of these pictures, I made some, some behind the scenes on my Instagram. So there are some stories of how I created this picture, but the beautiful thing is that these sand dunes were super, super, super far from me. So I'm just sitting with my lens. And the reason why I, I am using this lens is because I want to compress the mountain that is in the background with the sand dunes. So it will look like this, this rock is absolutely massive, like endless. So it creates kind of this ethereal feeling when you see the sand dunes, uh, that it's very different than if I will do it with a wide angle. Basically with a wide angle, I will not be able to see Lara. Whilst I'm using this lens, I'm able to see the details of her standing there. And you can see all the mountain in the background. Again, this picture that I already showed you, this I took with the uh, 200, 600, something that is very far, but start looking at details of things that are happening. Like the tree that is right in front is basically like kind of a noise that you can barely distinguish that is a tree. I decided to include it because it helped me to frame to like to the mosque. But reality is that um, you're basically having like everything that is in front of the camera is disappearing. There's nothing in front of that. We also have white, um, sorry, fish eyes lenses like this one. And let me show you some picture that I took uh, back in 2015, I think, uh, here in Brooklyn Bridge. It's just being able to capture everything. I know you're more familiar with that, especially nowadays that cell phones include basically three cameras, wide angle, uh, normal lens that will be something like a 28, 32 millimeter lens. And then you have the telephoto lens that we don't use that much. I, I feel that people love more the wide angle than they love the, the telephoto, but I'm gonna sell you the telephoto lens. And I just want to show you a little bit of um, how it changes depending on the, on the picture, on the, on the place. So this is Shanghai. Um, this is with a 16, 35 millimeter lens. This is with the 24, 70. 
and this is with a 7200. That's the difference between the, the three lenses and while I'm capturing the whole place. So when it's about lenses and how to use them and when to use them, it's very a personal uh, choice, of course. As I told you, there are zoom lenses that I use a lot in my work, but there are also fixed lenses that basically what it means is that you cannot zoom. Like there is, there is nothing. It's just like a 35 millimeter lens, 50 millimeter, 80, 85, 100. Actually, I have one here. This is a 90 millimeter macro uh, lens. I cannot zoom with this lens. So if I want to get closer or I want to go further, I just have to walk with my, with my feet. Um, and there are pro and cons with each one of them. Um, and it's important to mention them. I feel that zoom lenses, in some cases, the, the pros, of course, is that you can zoom in and zoom out without you having to move. And that's useful at some point. But when we're starting, it makes us lazy in the sense that we, we think like, oh, that's, that's just there. I don't want to move. And I just zoom in to take a picture. And then maybe I'm just losing all the narrative of creating the photograph. A fixed lens somehow help us to that, okay, I have to get close. And you also start memorizing the angle that you're able to see with certain lens. So you just get the idea of how it looks like. Mm, but the, the, on, on the pro side of the, um, of the zoom lenses, I like that it gives me the possibilities. So when I'm traveling, especially, I think it's very important to me that I can have the chance to decide if I want to be closer or not to something or some situation, as I show you, for example, in, in, the, in the Ganges in Varnas in India, that I wasn't able to get closer physically. So I had the chance to take the picture by using a zoom lens. Um, but, and then I want to emphasize, especially on capturing people and photographing people. And I want to mention that if you want a good portrait, a good portrait is not made by just taking the biggest telephoto lens that you, that you can use and just zooming into someone's face or zooming into someone's action. It's more a matter of if you want to get compression, if you can get close, uh, closer to an action, I will suggest you to use a telephoto lens that will help you to get that result. But also you can get very beautiful results when you're creating portraits or when you're approaching people just with, um, with a wide angle lens, because it means that you have to have that proximity with the people that you're photographing. They have to know you, they are aware that you're there and somehow you have their approval that your, their picture can be taken. And to me, that's, that's very beautiful. That, that tells the whole story. Um, like this one where these girls are, uh, I was, this is in the Holy Festival in India and they were just gonna throw a bucket of um, water with color to my camera. And these three girls just noticed that this was gonna happen and they just like kind of hold me and took me to their side and they start beating the men that were gonna throw me the bucket of water. And while they are beating them, I'm just taking their portraits. Um, and it's very intimate. You can tell that I was super, super close to them and I'm able to, yeah, just to connect and, and get this feeling, this also this uh, point of view that in my personal perspective, it's, mm, it gives more, it connects more because it has, you have to build that intimacy even if it's for some seconds that when I shoot, uh, that when I shoot the, with a telephoto lens, and I'm just uh, super far from the scene that sometimes might look beautiful, but sometimes uh, also don't have that personality. Maybe it has another feeling more like in this case, nostalgic, or if I look at this, it's more like the, the wow feeling of the huge, um, the huge uh, baobab trees in the background. Or if I look at this picture, it's more like the wow feeling of a, uh, huge massive landscape with a with just a person walking there but i'm not interested in that intimacy when i'm when i'm building uh the photograph so 
these are differences that will really impact in how your pictures are going to look like. And I think it's very important that you consider what lenses you want to use when you're photographing something. And this is part of planning a capture. And planning a capture, it's not only that you will photograph something or someone who will model in front of you or some city or some place, but as well that you will understand that, okay, I'm going out and I'm just gonna take my 16, 35 millimeter lens because today I just want to capture every, like all the landscape and I will try to play with everything that is in the frame to make it more powerful. Or no, today I'm going to Dead Valley and I'm just interested in having that compression and that the, that, the, that the mountains in the background will look massive and she will look like the only person standing in the sand dunes. So everything that I do before uh, any trip is just planning ahead. I just know exactly where I'm going. Uh, the locations, I try to understand if I want to get this, I want to get this compression or I want to have something more wide and majestic in, in a sense. And then I decide the lenses that I'm going to bring with me. So this is part of the planning when you're taking any photograph. And yeah, it's, it's what I want to discuss with you. I would love to jump now, uh, open the, the questions so we can discuss a little bit um, what, what questions do you have for, about lenses? Uh, if there is something else you would like to, to cover and ask, that's, this is the beautiful moment where, where we can do it and share some good examples. So mm -hmm. Linda was asking about using a teleconverter on a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Specifically, does it degrade the image? Is it worth using teleconverters? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, have, I have very rarely used them. I think it's worth it if you, if you if you need to capture something that is very, very far and you have no option, let's say safaris, uh, if you're capturing yeah, a lion and you don't have a 200, 600, but you have the 100, 400 millimeter lens, you just use it and you're able to, to capture it. I feel that the quality depend, depends on the, on the teleconverter that you're using. I know that the Sony ones, uh, you just lose a little bit of light probably one stop, half of a stop, depending on the teleconverter that you're using. Um, but the quality shouldn't be uh, reduced. However, I prefer to just use the lenses that I have. And I, in that case, I prefer to use um, very high megapixel camera and then crop a little bit if, I'm, if that's the need. Uh, but that, that de depends a lot on what you're capturing. Okay, Leslie's asking manual or autofocus. Ah, great question. And let's let's solve what is that? Like what is manual and autofocus? Like and I remember that I got asked this question last session. And basically here on the lens you will have this option that says AF or MF. And the reason for that is that uh, cameras and camera producers have created a system that uh, the focus works using contrast. So when you press the shutter, when you when you pre-focus, when you press the, the shutter to the middle, it tried to look for the place where you get the most contrast and it tried to focus there. So you can play with the focus like I'm just doing here. Uh, maybe I, I know it's hard to see, but I'm just playing with the, with the focus point and trying to focus. I prefer to use it because I find it more accurate than, than the manual focus. I know that there are photographers who prefer to shoot manual. Um, the first reason I think one photographer will love to shoot manual is because it looks cooler. So when you just take the camera and you start doing something like this and you have to focus, it, it looks like, like, wow, he's just focusing there. Um, but I don't care about that so much. I care, um, I care more about getting the, the, the frame that I want, getting in the precise moment that I'm looking. Uh, so that's, that's my personal choice. Um, and also I, and I know, I, I think Derek, you use manual focus so you can, we can have some, some interesting conversation about it, but it's like, 
many of my students who have told me that they prefer to use manual focus because they like it more, they feel that it's more precise. They have a few pictures that they have lost because they notice that it's slightly out of focus. Not, it's not like it's terribly out of focus. It's like slightly, like you capture and it's you think that it's in, in Just focus enough. here. And Just it's, enough to bother you. And then you open up in your computer, in your screen, and it's like, oh gosh, it's slightly out of focus. So I don't like to have those, those shots. I, I, I can't stand it. So I prefer to, yeah, to go with some electronical tools that will help me to, to do it. Um, well, especially with the technology now um, on the Sony cameras, with the technology that when you have animal eye autofocus and now we're at the point where cameras, certain cameras can pick up the shape of a head, even if you're not facing the camera. So mm -hmm. I think it makes it one of those things where you, there's certain circumstances that call for manually focusing. Uh, and am I, think I wrong everyone if you use, how. Do, you, do you use manual focus? Or? I, I do, I do. I mean, I'm a street photographer, so mm -hmm. I, I my roots are in zone focusing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of one of those things where I think everyone should know how to manually mm -hmm. focus and they mm -hmm. should be comfortable enough with it, where if you hit a certain a circumstance where you need to have to use it, you have to use you should it be able yeah. to, to jump over to it. But I, I rely heavily on autofocus. Why not? Why not let the technology take over? It's that's yeah. what we get these cameras for. The, I mean, the less attention that I have to put on, on the stuff that I'm doing with my hands and the more I can concentrate on what's happening on the frame. So at some point, I know that if you practice a lot, as it happens with you, it will become a second nature. Um, but well, then if you really want to miss pictures and you want to practice a lot, then you will have to, I mean, you will have to suffer, go through that. I prefer to rely on technology. And I think Sony is doing great with that. There you Definitely. go. Definitely. Our next question comes from Mark is asking the best lens for street photography. Oh, well, that's that's more a question for you. No, but I, I think to me, I, I very much like the wide angle lenses. I'm not, if, if you look at, at my lenses and my cameras, I love, uh, big cameras, big lenses. I I am not the person who will go with a really small camera. I don't feel so comfortable. I need a camera that I feel that it's big enough. I don't know why. It's just a personal preference. Nothing that will change really in the picture, in the final one. Uh, I think I will love the, the 16, 35 millimeter lens because it's more challenging to comp My personal opinion is that it's more challenging to create a composition, a good composition with a wide angle lens than with a telephoto. Telephoto helps you compress to uh, kind of avoid backgrounds, to concentrate on the main subject, whilst the wide angle help like force you somehow to understand that everything that is in the frame matters, that everything is telling a story. And if you, uh, that, that's just more challenging. So I like it more because of that reason. Perfect. And uh, David is asking, can you discuss the concept of hyperfocal distance on wide angle versus telephoto lenses? Oh, uh, we will we will have to spend another another <laughs> good hour, maybe not an hour, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, basically no no. I mean uh, no, it's, I don't want to be unfair with that question. That that deserves that deserves a good long time. How, how yeah. about we do this, Mark? Or uh, it was David that asked that. If we can, you know, we're going to throw up your, your website, your social handle on here. And I, yeah, and I can just solve and it way, and we can discuss it for sure. That, that will be better. And I can definitely, so doing. David, we're going to drop Esteban's Instagram and website into the chat there. And, and that, it, yeah, I agree. Hyperfocal distance. And, 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 and I'm sure, and I'm sure that there is people who is already here, like what telephoto lens, wide angle, 85 millimeter, 35. So if I just go to that, I, I will just <laughs> kill a, them. <laughs> that's a, that's a loaded, loaded question there. So yeah. basically for those who aren't aware, your hyperfocal, hyperfocal distance is the distance that gives your photos the greatest depth, the field. And you know, like Esteban kind of went into a lot of stuff, when you're talking depth of field, it has to do with the distance between you and your subject, your subject in the background. And so there's... basically there are calculators that will help you to understand uh, the distance, the focal length that you're using, the distance that you're capturing your subject. 
Uh, so there is a physical distance that if you focus at that specific distance, you will get the most out of the like the depth of field, uh, which is very useful for landscape. Um, theoretically, which is interesting in the practice, I have found that even yeah, I, 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 this is a long topic. I'm sorry, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, that's we'll, we'll drop Estevan's information there. And if anybody wants to reach out, definitely go shoot him a follow on Instagram and check out his work. Um, our next question comes from Bobby here. Bobby's asking, uh, when she traveled internationally, she would take zoom lenses that would provide a wide range of focal lengths. Recently purchased the 18 to 300 millimeter lens for her Sony A6400. Mm -hmm. Should Bobby consider having more lenses with her? Also has a 10 to 18 Sony FE. Travels with the 24 to 200 lens for the A7 III. It's, I, I mean, uh, it's a good question. I just think that there are things to consider. Uh, there are prime lenses that will basically will mean that you will have a wider, you can you can wider um, apertures, so you can open to two point eight. So basically, you will have more light, or you can create a blurrier background just by getting close to your subject uh, using a telephoto uh, focal length and also um, opening the aperture. If that's your interest, maybe yes, or at some point. But I think it's important to have the right amount of lenses. Uh, and the right amount of lenses depends on everyone's uh, interest and what you're capturing. Because when it's about um, photography, if you travel with too many lenses, then you get in you get into the hotel and then you're thinking like okay what lens i'm going to take today and then it's really hard for you to decide which lens you want to take so you want to take them all so you take a huge heavy uh bag with you and then you just walk one block and you're tired and you're stressed with that bag and you don't, you don't pay all attention into the picture that i think it's more important so i prefer just to have a couple of lenses i usually travel this is what i travel with the lenses that i just show you but I, when I go to the street, I just take one lens, one camera, and that's how I go and start capturing. Not more than that. Perfect. David, we're going to get a bonus question here for David. Since we couldn't easily answer his first question, we're going to have to dive into that privately. Sorry. He's asking if you shoot with your glasses on or off. Oh, man, being a photographer. You know, I started using glasses back in 2018, and I hate it. I hate it because every time I have to do this and it's so annoying and I have to do this with my glasses. So sometimes, and there is, this is the problem. Like when I'm not wearing my glasses, I can barely see. So if one day you see me on the street and I don't say hello, it's because, and I'm not wearing glasses, it's because of that. Um, so I, I don't like it because in order to be able to see, I have to wear my glasses. But then when I'm wearing the, like when I have to look through a viewfinder, I just have to, yeah, just to leave them up and, and start using them, which is, you get used to it, but it's uncomfortable. I would prefer to, again, I, some of you will suggest, well, use these lenses, you know, like, yeah. But, but then it's like, I get to places where it's difficult to sanitize them and get, you know, take care of them. So it, it gets tricky. All right. So and our, I move them, yeah. our final question here coming from Reed's joining us on Zoom. Since lenses are so expensive, if you could mm -hmm. only have a couple other than the kit lens, what would you recommend? Uh, if it's a Sony lens, the 60, it's my favorite. It's super complicated. The first time that I took a wide angle lens in my life, I loved it but it was so difficult to get a really good picture because everything is there. So you have, you really have to concentrate on how to make all that white canvas beautiful and the narrative in there are powerful for your pictures. Yes. And I will throw this in. Um, yes. If you are shooting Sony, they do have a beautiful trio of small light lenses. Um, if you look up the Sony trio, these are Sony G lenses. I believe, what is it? A 24, a 40, and a 50. Yeah. And they're light. They're small. They're, they're going to be less expensive than the G Masters, but still great quality. Great and quality. just in general, uh, whether you're a Sony shooter or not, no matter what you're shooting with, a lot of times the best thing to do is to either borrow a lens from somebody 
or rent lenses. You can pay $50, $60, rent a lens for a week and really try it out and see if that's the right lens for you. Yeah, before you buy it. Yeah. It's really important to, to, to really get to know the lens before you, especially if you're going to travel or if you're going to invest on, on a lens. Definitely. It's I can't really tell you how many to... lenses I bought where I, you know, you drop $1,500. Like, oh, I think I'll like this lens. Let me just yeah. buy it. And then I next know. thing you know, you use it twice a year and it's just sitting in your bag. So um, th- that'll be the wise last words for this hour of information is really you know, when we're talking about lenses, it's so relative, right? Esteban, you got to know what you, what you want to do. There's so many different lens op- options out there. Not yeah. everybody likes primes. Not everybody likes zooms. Some people shoot only at the longer end of the spectrum and some people shoot very wide open. Yeah. And I just really wanted to give you guys uh, like a very basic notion. Then our, we have a specialized lenses, macro lenses, uh, lenses for architecture. There are so many as is, there's a huge diversity of lenses that we will need also like a whole thing but this is basic photography so we're start we're starting step by step uh i know there are some of you that are more advanced so we'll get to that we'll get at some there. point well luckily they don't have to wait long it's, normally it's like you know we'll see you next week but yeah. we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow yeah. 5 p.m. And this, we actually have a bonus. As I was saying earlier, we have uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Sony artist and Tony Gale is going to be with us talking about getting started with your Sony camera. So for those of you who own a Sony, even if you're not a new Sony owner, I suggest you tune in because you might pick up some stuff. Tony Gale knows the cameras front to back. So even if you think you know your camera, you're probably missing something. And then Esteban's going to follow that up at 5 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow with part four of this six-part series sponsored by Sony. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about white balance, raw versus JPEG, your histogram. So tomorrow we're, we're getting our hands dirty tomorrow. We're getting a yep. little bit more into the, the tricky into the stuff, cameras. right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So we'll be waiting for you tomorrow. Sounds good. Well, Esteban, thank you again for your, your time, your expertise. Of course, thank you, Sony, for sponsoring this wonderful series. We'll see you guys back here tomorrow. Another rendition of the BNH virtual event space is in the books. Take care of you all, guys. Bye-bye.